So, ladies and gentlemen, again, a very warm uh, welcome. We know that everyone is very busy at this time. Um, I've just sent out a reminder to our participants that we are about to start the webinar, so people may uh, join us uh, as we go. You've reached the uh, Global Health Supply Chain Procurement Supply Management Webinar for Workforce uh, Development. Um, today's topic is on the big learning platform, and we've invited uh, a guest company to present today, Empower School of Health. Um, I've been working with uh, Empower um, since approximately 2015 or so in different activities and projects I've been involved with. You will have seen a number of invitations that I have sent out through our community of practice uh, with regards to the education opportunities that uh, Empower offers, both their face-to-face -face courses uh, as well as their online um, graduate diploma and other online learning opportunities. Uh, in recent months, they've been uh, developing a new approach to coordinating uh, learning and information sharing with regard to supply chain management in the health sector in countries. And we were very excited about what they were doing and enjoyed the innovation. And so we've invited them to uh, speak to us today. Um, the overall uh, director of uh, Empower School of Health is uh, Dr. Paul Lavalny, and uh, he is going to be one of a couple of speakers from the Empower team. I would like to hand the call uh, over to Paul for, so he can introduce himself uh, more fully and um, pass over this uh, conversation to you. So, Paul, I'd like to hand over to you, and again, a warm welcome to everyone uh, as we hear this guest presentation today. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, first, just to confirm if you can hear me okay. Yep, loud and clear. Great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the call. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, uh, we expect there'd be a few more joining as, as we go on. Um, the, um, so quick introduction about myself and, um, and Empower very briefly, and then we can jump onto the presentation. Um, my, my background, I used to head Global Funds Procurement and Supply Chain Division. Um, at the time, we had a budget to the tune of uh, almost $2 billion in PSM uh, for products and services, and more than half the budget uh, was unspent. Um, and this is working across more than 100 countries. And it was um, a real shame because the countries needed the products, the, the beneficiaries and users needed the products, but countries didn't have the absorptive capacity to do the necessary, take the necessary actions to get the products to the last mile. And what was happening was um, a vicious negative cycle where countries weren't able to get the products. Um, Global Fund was not able to um, uh, disperse the funds, and then donors were not funding Global Fund. Um, so it was negative all along. Um, after leaving uh, 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 Global Fund, um, I founded the Empower School of Health. And as the name of the organization suggests, um, our whole focus was trying was um, understanding the needs of the individuals. Um, I had worked in the country, I've worked in several countries, in Africa, in, in Middle East, in Asia, uh, worked for Management Sciences for Health, worked for donors, worked for the Gates, um, advised the Gates Foundation, um, and finally felt that uh, the place where we could make an impact is to build capacity of individuals. Um, so we've, we've developed tools and processes and approaches that help us first understand the needs of the individual, um, and then build uh, support structures that guide them, help them grow in their particular job, what they're doing, their careers, over a period of time on a continuous, ongoing basis. Um, and we work across um, my initial focus, and that's my background, uh, is supply chain. Um, and again, based on my background, we brought in management and leadership as capacity building um, support structures as well. 
and we work with various partners, including um, uh, including uh, Johns Hopkins University, President Kufors Foundation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we don't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Uh, we believe in a great deal of partnerships. Um, and one more thing I should uh, highlight and emphasize is, um, especially in the area of procurement supply chain capacity building, um, Empower is works very closely with people that deliver. Um, it's a global initiative um, of which uh, some time back Andrew was the executive manager. It's hosted by UNICEF and it includes all the key stakeholders including um, uh, we, we've now catalyzed for Chemonix to be sitting on there, USAID's their Global Fund, um, and various other stakeholders. We, um, I am personally the co-chair of this organization and we are on the board. Um, so, so really important, um, uh, a point of, um, uh, a point of emphasis there as well. So with that, I'd like to jump to the presentation. Um, Sid, if you could go to the next slide, please. So, um, um, briefly, um, the presentation outline is a little bit about Empower, then about the Big Learning Platform, and then um, give you a sense of what it looks and feels like, a Big Learning Walkthrough, and, um, and also what the, um, the, the deployment and um, country, uh, um, basically country deployment process would be. Next. Next. So as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, one of, uh, you know, we, you cannot achieve anything um, in a significant way, um, whether you're in, you know, any part of Ministry of Health or in any work that you do, um, unless and until there is strong leadership, um, strong mentoring, and a sort of a strong support system as well. Um, so while we focus on technical elements, um, leadership management and strategic communication is also a core area. And personally, I've been um, uh, quite fortunate to have someone such as His Excellency who's been supporting uh, my growth and um, our Empower's vision from a leadership um, and a focus point of view as well. Um, he's an incredible gentleman. He turns 80 this year, and he's still as young as um, probably my age in, in many ways. Next. So, again, very briefly, we've talked about this. Our focus um, is capacity building, and we bring innovations. We bring innovations for capacity building, whether it's face-to-face, -face, it's online, it's blended, um, it's um, using case studies, using field trips, um, it's on the job uh, strengthening and capacity building for those who can't travel, don't have the funds. And all of this, to be honest, really started when, um, with feedback from our participants. We've got more than 3,000 students, participants, etc. cetera, um, over the years, and um, it's basically listening to you guys and, and understanding what, what is needed um, and, and which has helped us to scale. So all these di different methods and approaches have been applied accordingly. Next. So a few of our senior team members, Andy uh, Barakloff um, uh, will be joining us. He might have already joined. Um, and uh, he's based in Thailand. Sangeeta is based in India. Uh, Ambassador Denis Brun is our Empower Swiss director. He's based in Geneva, um, and I am between India and Geneva most of the time. Um, and in fact, actually, that's not entirely accurate. I'm usually between Africa and uh, different parts of Asia. Uh, my focus is typically trying to understand um, the gaps and the needs and helping countries uh, kickstart areas of support that might be needed. Next. We have Professor Barakloff online as well. Okay, Andy, welcome. Greetings. Thank you. Next. 
So about the, um, sorry, now go back. Um, you know, this is something from Margaret Chan, but I need to quote something from my friend Tedros, um, with, the, with the new Director General. But this is a very um, accurate uh, statement, and this is where we as procurement <coughs> and supply chain professionals play a vital and critical role. Um, you know, it's, uh, where it states clearly, um, alternated drugs in the world won't do any good without an infrastructure for their delivery. Um, for the longest time, the supply chain group, the procurement supply chain group, um, both in public and private sector, have pretty much been in the basement um, and behind the scenes. We're now starting to see real changes um, happening both in, again, public and private sector. Um, I remember developing the Gates Foundation's access and delivery strategy in 2006. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, prior to that, they were only focused on discover and develop, and <coughs> delivery was not the area of focus. Um, and in the private sector, um, uh, the most valuable company in the world, Apple Computers, has um, uh, a CEO, Tim Cook, who has a, comes from the supply chain background. So we're starting to see real fundamental changes. Um, the Global Fund now has significant focus on um, you know, access, USAID, access. Um, understanding the largest, one of the largest programs that, that Chemonix has won and is deploying is access and delivery. So it's really, I mean, um, the, the leaders, the leadership uh, in countries and globally have understood the importance of this. Next. So why, what are we thinking? What's the background? What are the, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and, um, by the way, in, um, I don't know if it's in, um, can we move, there, there's a, um, and it says empower guest on, on top of the slides, can that be moved to the side? I, I can't seem to control that, it's blocking a part of the slide, so if someone can move that, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> and while, while that happens, let me just continue. Um, so what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, when we talk about human resources in terms of gaps, one is the number of uh, the required human resource capacity. As you would all know, the number of people working at the ministry um, are usually, there's, there's a large vacancy rate. And according to WHO, this ranges anywhere from 20% to as, as high as 70%, depending on uh, which cadre of people and which part of the country. Um, on top of that, many of them aren't trained appropriately or don't have the necessary background or education, which means effectively what you're getting is maybe 25% of the human resource capacity that you actually need. In addition, you've got health systems in countries <coughs> that need rebuilding, lots of challenges, or need strengthening. Um, the work that um, Global Fund, Gates, um, um, USAID-funded programs uh, are doing in terms of maturity of supply chains. Most of them are in, in the relatively, um, uh, most of them are on the relatively weak side. Very few are on what's being termed as gold or accredited. Many of them are in canvas and silver range, which means they're still developing. Um, so, so weak health systems. And on top of that, imagine that there are new policies um, on an ongoing basis, new technologies, new suppliers. Um, and, and in this dynamic environment, we are trying to make sure that the best quality treatment product um, used in the best possible way is done so at the last mile in primary healthcare centers, um, having gone through the entire chain of, of not just supply, but also the public health professionals. So an incredibly difficult task. Next slide. So, um, so our thinking was, what is it that we might develop? What is needed is um, coming up with a solution, what we call the big learning platform or the big learning solution, um, big for big data because there's so much information and knowledge and data, both global and, and local, uh, that is needed. And le learning as in scalable learning um, because it can't be done in classrooms and training of trainers only gets you so far. 
So unless you bring innovations, unless you bring um, new ways of, um, and we'll discuss a bit more, new ways of continuous learning, and this is something that Andrew's um, emphasized and, and everybody pretty much is emphasizing, there is, we need to have continuous dispersed learning. Um, so face-to-face -face classrooms are expensive and not scalable and don't allow for on-the-job support and follow-up, uh, which used to be the, you know, the main way of learning. Um, digital learning platforms are now scaling in developing countries. Digital literacy is growing. I mean, we, we've got countries using M-Pesa and mobile money even before it was being used uh, or is being used in developed countries, which is fantastic. And the cost of digital infrastructure and bandwidth is decli uh, declining significantly. So all of these um, uh, variables allow us to consider a new paradigm and approach uh, which is needed um, for bringing in digital learning. And so what, what the big learning is is a four-part integrated platform. Next slide, please. And um, this, this integrated platform, uh, if you look at uh, the chart and if you look at the, um, uh, the, the outer periphery, and this was really important. Again, this is the feedback we received from, um, uh, from minister, uh, the, let's say, the Minister of Health. We, uh, they're even on our advisory of uh, Afghanistan in one case, all the way down to the last mile, people who would need it. Um, is whatever you do, make it country specific, um, make it country owned and managed. Don't, don't just create something that, and many of the global ones exist. You know, WHO has their online platform. UNICEF has an Agora platform. Um, we have our own. Um, you know, JSI, others, they're, they're all out there, but it doesn't meet the, it's not country specific, it's not country owned or country managed, and it's not cloud-based or open source. So how do we bring it to the countries that they own, control, and manage? That was one key component um, of, of this platform. Next slide. Yeah, um, and um, the the other aspect is in terms of um, if we just stick to those those elements. So country specific um, is personalized to country requirements, product support from Empower, choice of language. Uh, we work right now in English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Hindi. Um, we're we're being asked to add Arabic and Swahili and other languages. So that's not a problem. And even when we do English. Um, and if it's online learning or the support that's needed, um, it is appropriately accented English for that particular country. So Ghanaian English is different from Kenyan versus South African. So it's really customization to that point. Um, open source we talked about, built on open source platform, option to integrate with other programs through APIs. Um, so it's really um, uh, giving you that flexibility, giving the countries that flexibility or the Ministry of Health program. Um, ownership, um, owned and handled by them, um, and we would just provide the IT and technical support, and if they can handle that, even better, um, and host it on the clouds. Next. Within, um, so those were the uh, sort of the principles of the big learning platform. The features um, include their four key elements, um, <clears throat> which um, we'll go into a bit more deeper later on as well. The first one is what we call the knowledge queue, and that's like, imagine a wiki health, all your health information and knowledge um, that would be needed. So um, let's say you are a, um, a supply chain or a warehouse manager in one of the district, um, one of the districts of a country. Um, and you would need certain um, types of information, knowledge, um, to perform your functions. So what we do is we create that knowledge cube, that WikiHealth um, is created in a way that can be customized um, for that particular individual, um, whether it's that uh, a person at the district level at working at a warehouse or a manager working at uh, in the capital of that country and managing the Ministry of Health and, and perhaps has about 100, 200, 500 people reporting to him or her. Um, and this would include things such as uh, policies, manuals, guidelines, budgets, um, uh, SOPs that the individual might need 
both global um, global elements or national elements that they would need. So that's a knowledge queue. The second part, if we go to the right, is the learning and development platform. And that's uh, built around, again, as we had uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, competency-based learning. First, you do a self-assessment. You understand where the gaps are of these individuals. Um, and they get scored relative to others in their own department or internationally to see uh, how they are performing. And, it's a, and they get that result immediately and instantly, and it's a, it's a free competency-based learning. And uh, based on that, they would then build their own uh, programs of learning online, face-to-face. -face. Some are free, some are paid. And this would be curated and aggregated from around the world. So it would not just be Empower's uh, courses. Um, we have 20 or 30, but by the time you curate everybody's course um, uh, courses, across there would be easily 200 300 um, relevant courses we would then uh, provide the necessary search filters to get you to the last um, to find exactly what you need based on what the gaps are if I go to the bottom left now on the job TA um, this is this is vital because you know people can't leave their jobs and travel um, it's expensive. It takes time. It's, it takes time away from work. It takes time away from family. Um, and, and after you've spent a week or a month outside learning, what you want to do is to apply that knowledge or information. But what is missing there is getting that on-demand technical assistance, on-the-job support, coaching, mentoring um, on an ongoing basis. And that's something that's built into the platform. And the fourth part, peer-to-peer, -peer, is really bringing together. So imagine um, if uh, I am the director or the manager of, of a supply chain department with 500 people across multiple districts that all report to me, and I need to manage them. I need to make sure that they're um, updated in terms of the new policies or a new supply or a new rapid diagnostic test um, uh, that they need to be aware of. Um, I'm able to communicate to them. It's your WhatsApp equivalent of communication on an ongoing, on an ongoing basis. It could be one-to-one. -one, uh, it could be one-to-many. It could be, um, you know, someone at one district speaking to another district uh, uh, individual at a warehouse saying, hey, listen, I'm out of stock, or maybe I have a quality issue. Uh, are you experiencing something similar? And all of this information is then captured uh, and available uh, from a learning point of view, from, from an introspection point of view, to see what changes and edits might need to be made. Next. So it looks like a complicated slide, but if you just stay on the left-hand side of the slide first. So with the big learning platform, and the reason it's both a global and the reason why it's so powerful and why it, why it needs to be in this way is because you need to take global knowledge. You need to um, then adapt it to make it national. And then within national, you need to then further adapt it, screen it to make it local. If you, because in the end, we are doing local capacity building. That is our target group. But there's a lot of global knowledge that's needed that's common across many countries because that's usually the starting point. So if you move a little bit to the right and you'll see all those little arrows everywhere, um, you know, you have your UN agencies, you have your donors, you have academia, you have uh, different groups, each one coming up with different technologies or different policies, uh, different guidelines. We capture all that. We do that screening across. We then, based on countries' policies, um, countries' SOPs, guidelines, um, work with the country uh, country team uh, country team members um, who then uh, work in terms of helping us to streamline customize and uh, come up with what is country specific policies guidelines SOPs etc and then we take these all the way down and then we would have our health workers and mentors who'll be able to provide serve, uh, support on an ongoing basis next slide Um, I'll run through this quickly, just so that you have a sense of what it looks and feels like. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Just keep putting the questions. I'll, I'll go through um, uh, the questions. Uh, team, if you can just um, 
make sure that they're collected, and then we'll walk we'll walk through that as well. Um, big big learning walk. You can just take the next slide, please. Um, actually, it might be um, so on here. Um, if you see the three components, for example, you uh, the question was, what's the difference between the knowledge cube and learning and development? Um, so uh, significant uh, a difference. So, uh, and this is when you sign on to um, uh, sign on to the big learning platform. Uh, this is your opening page. The knowledge. Think of the knowledge tower as all the documents information and knowledge you need um, that is country specific or program specific um, that you need to do your work your your particular activity your particular tasks so you might need budgets sops manuals etc it's country specific organizational specific um, that's that's knowledge tower the learning and development is individual specific you do your own for you, to, let's say you are a, a procurement um, manager and your job is procurement. It's not supply chain, it's not rational use, it's none of that. So you need to be a procurement expert. All the documents that you would need uh, in terms of which products are approved for procurement, um, all of that would be in the knowledge tower, but how to do better procurement, um, it would be um, in the learning and development. And there would be a self-assessment to tell you that, in fact, you're pretty good at procurement or you're not so good at procurement and you should probably do these courses and these are free um, and these are online, things like that. That's your learning and development. Okay. Next slide. So we'll go through this rather quickly. You would register, you would put your contact details, your education, professional background. Next. You would pick your areas of interest um, in w whether it's procurement and supply chain or whether you're working in, in MIS or IT or quality assurance or a particular disease area. Maybe you're working in TB, HIV, malaria. Next. Knowledge Tower, go ahead. I think we've actually talked a lot about this already. So, yeah, so this gives you a sense. And, and, the, and the power of this is, so think of, uh, the Knowledge Health Cube has a bunch of different topics in, a, in an appropriate architecture that's been designed. Go ahead. And within, uh, within that, there will be a, sp a specific, let's say, if you're working in immunization and we create an immunization supply, supply chain cube, and within that, there would be uh, further um, uh, segmentation in terms of how the architecture is created. Next. Go ahead, next. Go ahead. So when you do the learning and development, you'd come on to this site. You would be able to search courses, filter the courses uh, uh, by different categories. And then there would also be, based on what you've selected, your areas of interest, your areas of work, there would be some automatically selected for you as well. Next. You would go through a, a competency assessment, which will give you your strengths and weaknesses. This is something that's been developed in partnership with people that deliver that I had mentioned earlier. Um, and it's a free it's a free tool. Next. And it would list the courses you may want to consider taking for yourselves um, uh, as you grow into that particular job. Next. <laughs> Waiting to go next. Is it stuck? Yes, there might be a delay. Okay. All right. As as we are waiting, maybe I can take a look at the questions very quickly. I'm not clear the difference. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. That we've already answered that. Um, the um, let me just open my slide deck. I can speak to that a little bit in the meantime. Um, Yeah, the next is on technical assistance. So what is interesting about TA is now think of, um, so you've got access now to all your policies, manuals, etc. Normally these are sitting on people's desks or on their on their um, uh, bookshelves um, or or on their laptops. And and if that person and individual leaves, 
the challenge is for that organization, that institutional memory is lost. So remember, we moved it from an individual-based um, approach to an organizational-based approach now. Um, that knowledge is available for the individual. He started to, he or she started to strengthen himself or herself in the process. They've taken new courses, and now they're applying this new knowledge and information. And while they're applying it, they may wish someone to either review their documents or speak to some global experts or even take global tours. We have virtual tours of different organizations and entities such as uh, the World Health Organization, Gavi and others, um, with people that are working in this space as well. But the most useful here is you can um, ask questions, people would respond, you can have your documents reviewed. Um, and these are some of the, for example, global experts, they would be in different parts of the world, uh, from uh, Africa to Asia, similar time zones, similar language, same language, um, English, French, um, Portuguese. Well, Portuguese is always a, a bit of a challenge, but English and French for sure. Um, uh, Russian um, and Spanish, these are quite straightforward, but we can always add some of the other more national languages as well. Next. And you'd be able to speak to them in real time if needed, um, or usually what's needed is that a question goes out, somebody reviews a forecasting or reviews a budget and comes back and says, it looks pretty good, but you may have forgotten a couple of things. Okay. Um, in the tours, um, which is really interesting, and the reason why we added that, again, was feedback from, from uh, participants, um, was, uh, you know, I'm sitting in a, a, a district level or maybe even um, at a facility, but I would love to see or, or know and understand what a, um, you know, a tertiary hospital supply chain looks like or what a regional or national warehouse looks like. Um, and so what we're doing is building in, uh, and we, depending on what is of interest, build in um, uh, these uh, short, you know, 360 degree view um, audio videos um, of, of these entities and organizations. Next. I'll need to stop pretty quickly. I want to leave time for you guys to um, ask questions as well. Um, Sid, very um, quickly just um, go through. Um, let me see. Can we? Um, right, so rollout um, anywhere from two to four months. Um, uh, in terms of the scoping, understanding your needs, there's a platform uh, rollout in a particular country and then hand-holding and support. Go ahead. Um, again, uh, we'll share the presentation with you, but then there are basically, when uh, we've talked about this, um, needs assessment rollout, and then if it's of interest, then countries then decide to work with us. Next. The second part is the, um, uh, the platform rollout itself. It needs to be customized or adapted to the needs. There's on-site rollout and then hand-holding um, and populating the content jointly. Everything is done jointly with the country, with the program, so that they eventually then take over. While we focus on more of the global content, which of course would be very difficult, they would focus on the, the local national content. Next. Yeah, and handholding and continued support once it's set up, product support, product maintenance, um, on-demand TA as needed. Next. That's okay, we'll talk about that later. There are different features, basic or advanced, depending on what you need. And in terms of cost, sorry, yeah, it's okay, go ahead. In terms of um, cost, there's uh, typically um, one-time setup cost, um, which would be fixed, and if you want uh, countries wanted more customized, there'd be additional features and costs or ongoing, um, usually uh, per month or actually it's more slab based um, in terms of uh, 25 people or 50 people or 100 people who'd be working on it. So it's um, from that point of view uh, in terms of providing the support um, and then there'd be additional optional costs as well. If the country does more work, um, and um, or the program does more of their own work and can handle most of it, uh, the costs go down. If they want something that's uh, more or less off the shelf, the costs go down. Next. 
That's it. Thank you. Um, just before we jump to questions, um, Andy, Professor Andy Barakloff, um, some things I may not have uh, may have forgotten or not emphasized. Uh, if you could just speak for a few minutes, and then we turn it over for about 15 minutes for Q and A. Okay. I hope you can hear me. So just a few moments. The main point about the big learning platform is a whole change in mindset. Training is not capacity development. Capacity development requires much more. But to address training, we've focused on far too much unsustainable programs. One week face-to-face -face courses have their value. But to go to scale has never been sustainable before. Now with modern technology and this big learning approach, it is possible to go to scale cost effectively to reach people individually and to make the training focused upon their particular needs. This is the power of the big learning platform. Yes, it's a large database, but it's far more than that because it brings the capacity for individual development in the areas that people are interested in. That motivation will hopefully drive it forward. These to me are the key points around big learning platform. Large database of information, that in itself is useful. The ability to be individually focused on capacity development and what the people want themselves, the areas they feel they need to grow in. That is its power. Okay, that's it from me, Paul. Over to you and the questions. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, so with that, let's, um, uh, let's leave a, uh, so this is for Andrew now. Um, great. Andrew, if you could um, uh, please facilitate the next session, that would be great. Sure, great. So uh, thank you so much. And um, it's uh, good to be exposed to these uh, new innovations. The floor is open to people who have questions. What I'd like to do is to, if you have a question, ask you to type your question in the chat. Uh, and then we can invite you to, to speak to that question. It's a bit hard to, to see otherwise. So. You'll see that there's a, a chat which is um, on the bottom left hand side of your screen. You need to click um, on the word bubble that's slightly rectangular, slightly square. Uh, that will open up the chat and please type in any questions that you have into the chat. Uh, and then we can we can um, invite you to speak to, to that. Uh, just while that's um, um, while people are taking the opportunity to make a couple of questions there. Um, I'd like to ask the first question. Um, you've um, mentioned a lot about the individual strength, uh, the strength of the learning platform to help with individuals. Would you like to make a couple of um, comments, um, Paul, about how such a platform could help strengthen an organization? So, for example, a Ministry of Health, uh, supply chain, parastatal, uh, or something similar. Just from, from that perspective, the individual development perspective has been emphasized, but what would you describe as the organizational focus for the learning platform? How does it help the organization? Right. And yeah, excellent point, Andrew. Um, I said it in passing, um, but, but didn't um, lay emphasis on this. Um, you know, the, at the heart of all of this um, is really finding a mechanism for creating institutional strength and institutional memory. Um, and the big challenge and problem is, you know, donors, um, donors support uh, or uh, support certain functions and activities. Um, and unfortunately, when a donor or that funding dries up, so does the capacity of a country. And it's happened again and again. Um, Fortunately, we are, um, most of the big donors are, are again focused on not vertical programs, but health system strengthening. So, um, in fact, um, last month I was at a big workshop with UNICEF, 15 countries, prior to that um, uh, with UNFPA, and all of it is now um, the focus being health system strengthening and within that supply chain strengthening. And what everyone is looking for is if we can find a mechanism where we are not individual, while we're supporting individuals to get stronger and better to perform the tasks and function and grow in their career, um, 
we, the organization should not be dependent on an individual. So if a manager gets promoted, if a district manager moves to the center, or somebody leaves and joins the private sector, or unfortunately what happens a lot, you get picked up by a UN agency or global fund and you go to Geneva, as happened with me and several other people, you create a void where you, where, where you were previously. So this system, what this really allows you to do is to build that institutional capacity and memory so that you're not relying on one, two or five people and you can quickly, whoever then comes in, can quickly get up to speed, identify where the gaps are, know where the knowledge and information is that they would need to perform. Um, but all of that, for all of that to happen, the machinery within the organization needs to be um, strengthened to make sure they continuously update that. But with this tool uh, and with this process and solution, that is now somewhat easier. I hope I answered that. Um, Andy, anything else to add to that in terms of institutional capacity or did I cover most of it? I think you covered most of it there. I mean, the point is that when we seek to disseminate new policies and procedures, they often don't reach all of the field of workers that we want. This gives the opportunity to go to the last mile, to go to the smallest health center and achieve access to all of this information. That's one of the ways it benefits institutions throughout. New standard operating procedures, new standard treatment guidelines don't always get out to the smallest health centers. This provides access to them throughout the system with backup information and support. That is the way I see institutional strengthening working through big learning. Thanks, Andy. Andrew, back to you. So the floor is open. Don't all rush, but we would love to have your questions. Um, to, to Please type in the chat those, those questions, um, and uh, we will have those answered for you. So um, just again, while those uh, people are, are, are worrying uh, in terms of thinking about questions they might want to ask, so it's great. We've got um, seven different uh, countries on the call today. All of those uh, represent the biggest countries as part of um, PSM. Um, they all are having sort of uh, budgets that are always being uh, squished. We can see the benefit of what you're describing. Can you give us, we understand that any particular budget is determined by um, country circumstances. Our project's currently in work planning. Can you give us a feel for the sort of ballpark sort of money as a startup and then as an annual cost to make something like this happen for, say, a workforce of um, 300 people? Right. Um, I'll also ask um, uh, my, my team to come, and I think this is critical. Um, and Andrew, you know, you and I talked about this. Um, earlier as well, and I went back to the team um, uh, in terms of um, getting our, um, <coughs> um, both in terms of scale and costs all, all planned out. And depending on the degree of uh, the number of features and the customization, obviously that, that variation is there. Um, if you keep it, if we start simple um, with very little um, configuration customization, the cost can be as low as $25,000 for a kickoff start, which is done over the first um, one to three months. Um, what was previously a much higher cost, we brought it down significantly. Um, and, then, um, and then what we have are different slabs, whether it's, let's say, um, 50 to 100 people or um, you know, going up uh, in, in blocks of 100 or up to 1,000, few thousand, depending on the country. Um, and these, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have my team tell me as well, but if it's like for 25, 50 people, 25 people or 30 people, it's as low as $5,000 a year uh, to be supported with this platform. So, um, we've, again, it's, it's pretty low. Um, and then it, and there are slabs in terms of the way it goes up. So I would imagine it would still be at about 30, 40 K. But uh, Tim, could you tell us if it's about um, three, the number was 300, but let's say if it's 100 uh, or 500, whatever numbers we have, could you just share that, uh, Singita or Sid? So uh, Siddharth here from Impala. Um, so like uh, Professor Paul mentioned, um, the cost, really depend on how much uh, 
hand holding we need to do uh, for a country uh, the basic the, the basic costs for uh, a basic version uh, can be as low as uh, as twenty five thousand dollars um, and it can go up to let's say about fifty thousand dollars depending on how much customization is required by a program or an organization or a country uh, and of course the scale of deployment uh, these are ballpark figures of course for for more advanced um, requirements uh, we will need to do a scoping study and uh, come up uh, with a set of requirements that will define that will define uh, the, the cost um, that is one part the other part is ongoing cost that again depends on the number of users that are onboarded and the kind of features that the program requires but um, uh, like professor paul mentioned again the starting slabs can be in the range of five to ten thousand dollars uh, and can go up to twenty to thirty thousand dollars for hundred users or more and at the very end of this presentation we've uh, uh, we're showing um, a sample uh, questionnaire that will help us determine the requirements of the country, the scope of uh, deployment. A lot of decisions will be taken by a, by a technology team in terms of what kind of configurations that the country would require, what would work over there um, as well. Great. Thank you, Sid. So, uh, Paul, we probably have about five minutes uh, left before people start to move away to go to their next meeting. Um, what I would like to ask you as you think about your particular closing remarks to emphasize is if people are interested in this, who should they contact and how should that contact take place if they want to get some more money, excuse me, get some more information, we all, we all would like more money, get some more information and particularly have a discussion about their local context and how you might be able to assist if this is something that interests them. Over to you, Paul. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'll ask my, as we're speaking, I'll ask my team to type in the email ID for anyone who needs more information um, so that everybody will have access to right now. Um, and uh, both in terms of clarifications, questions, one-to-one, uh, -one, whatever is needed, we're happy to, happy to provide that. Um, then we have a short, um, audio or, um, or a short video, if you haven't seen it, that, that takes all of this stuff that took me almost half an hour to communicate. It's, it's nicely presented in about 120 seconds. You could see that and you could share that with other colleagues. Um, and if you would like to run through a demo yourself, um, the team can also provide you uh, a password, username, to test it out to see, to get the look and feel of this as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So last chance for Fantastic. any questions on, on the call. Yeah. Team, can you also put the link to the, um, uh, the, uh, the big learning um, section of the page and the video, you can put it there so they can view that easily as well if they need to. Yeah, yeah sorry to interrupt, Andrew. Yeah, That's but fine. back to the people. And for participants uh, in your revised invitation for this call is the link to the video that Professor Paul is uh, referring to and there's also a uh, Word document that provides more details. So Paul, I want to thank you so much, uh, Professor Paul and Professor Andy, uh, to Sid and the team for taking your time to give a presentation on your innovation about the big learning platform. Um, within GHSC PSM, we are looking at different innovative ways to make a difference uh, when it comes to system strengthening and how to do that over time in an economical way that does make a difference in country. And this is a great idea to get us thinking uh, in that particular direction. For those participants who have taken the time to phone in today, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, I will be arranging a follow-up email that will have a recording um, and contact details, etc., cetera, for, for follow-up. Um, and uh, Paul, any last final uh, message before we close? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I would say that, um, and it goes back to your earlier question, um, you know, we're all part of the Team. I mean, this, uh, the people that we are speaking to, you're part of the GHSC PSM, um, and 
the the key role really is capacity building uh, of of the country of the program, and um, what what uh, what we had in mind when we developed this platform over the past um, over the past two years, building on ten years of experience, was really that how do we build something for a program for a country that stays with them. Even when we are gone, I may move on to something else, you may move on to another job, but the country and the program has something that is alive, that is regularly refreshed and updated and continues to help the people on an ongoing basis. So it's really, um, I, I think that's the message. It, it's, um, it can be up and ready, features can be up and ready in a short period of time within a few months, uh, one to three months. Um, and it's resilient. It stays um, with with the country to continue to support them. Great. Thank you very much for those uh, closing remarks. And there are a range of extra resources for people who wish to uh, learn more about the Big Learning Platform. So again, uh, Professor Paul, Professor Andy, and the Empower team, thank you for being our guest presentation today. We wish you well to move forward, and we look forward to being in touch. Thank you so much and bye for now.